morning, let's stand for scripture. From Psalm 71, 5 through 6. Lord, you are the King and the Lord. You have always been my hope. I have trusted in you ever since I was young. From the time I was born, I have depended on you. I will praise you forever. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I praise your name that we are able to be here to worship you together. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to uh, just erase everything in our brains that is keeping us from thinking about you, Lord, and just help us to zero in on your word, your spirit. Just help us to know that you're here with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your presence here with us this day. You are awesome. You are an awesome God. You are filled with love and mercy and love and righteousness, faithfulness. God, you are so great. You are so great, so worthy of us worshiping you, coming together into your house to lift up your name in the name of Jesus above all other names. Father, as we have met here this day, we do so because, yes, we honor you and we worship you, but we do so also because you have uh, told us in your word that if we have burdens and concerns upon our heart, we can lift them up to you. And so, Lord, we pray. And we lift those concerns to you. And we pray that you would be with each and every individual that we have a concern for in our heart right now. And Lord, we just pray that your will would be done. That your name would be glorified in every aspect of every need. We know, Lord, that you can work out all things for the good of those who love you. Even the hard times, even the suffering times, even the troubling times can be used to bring good into our world and into the lives of those who are affected. So, Lord, we just pray your will be done and your name glorified. We also ask, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word this morning. We know you're here. We really know that you'll be speaking to us. So it's really a matter of whether we're ready to hear it or not. So help us to listen. Listen with not only our ears, but with our hearts and our minds, that we might hear your word of comfort, your word of encouragement, yes, your word of challenge for this day. Father, we honor you, and we pray in the name of Jesus, amen, and amen. You may be seated. Okay, back at the beginning of the summer, we had honor council, and there was one little person that wasn't able to be there because he was sick. So we're going to kind of recreate it for a moment. So I need all of the kids that are in CLC or Life Club to come up here. in here. Hang on just a sec. What happens is all during the school year, we have a life club on Wednesday nights. And these young people come to life club and they work on these awards and badges that they have on their sashes. And we culminate the year's activities with what we call an honor council, as what Talena alluded to earlier, uh, honor council in the spring. And they get their badges and their awards at that time. All right. Like Tim said, that's what we're... You know, well, Leah was gonna let, was gonna share with her, but that's okay. They're gonna get her one. All right. What happens is <clears throat> every Wednesday night we meet, and we work hard some nights and we play hard some nights. The work hard nights are where you get all of the badges, okay? And all of these kids have been up. Uh, there, it's age three and up. So, thus, okay. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> age three and up, 
and um, they work on memory verses. Does anybody remember a memory verse? Can you remember any of them? I'm putting you on the spot, I know. Okay. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Okay, did anybody else remember one? Do you remember one, Tammy? Do you remember one? How about in the beginning? In the beginning. So just to make just to make Zoe feel a part of this, that's awesome. Perfect. Good job. Looky there. Now she's happy, right? <coughs> All right. So when we had honor council at the end of the year, Max was sick. So he didn't get to get his sash and get up front. So we're letting him be up here right now and getting his sash. These guys, the ones with the green sashes, are uh, what we call trackers, and they're before school. They're the kids that aren't in school yet, plus the kindergartners. And then the ones that have the blue sashes are first through sixth grade. And we have more first through sixth graders than this. They're just not here this morning. But we just kind of wanted to share this with you and let you know what we do on Wednesday nights and how important it is and how awesome the kids are. And they learn uh, not only Bible verses, but they learn how to um, tell people about Jesus. Okay, so basically, Sunday school is learning the stories. Church is worshiping, right? CLC or Life Club is learning how to take that information and give it out to other people and to share it with other people. So that's what we do on Wednesday nights. And we do have recreation nights and craft nights, but most of our nights are spent learning about Jesus and about how to share him with others. So, uh-huh. And playing games. And playing games. And playing games. Wall ball. Wall ball is the, the sport to play here. Now, when we did it at the end of the school year, we gave out things to the kids that were in um, the trackers. And, Max, this is what yours says. It says we're given Smarties given to Max Greenewald for learning and bringing a smile to class each week. Rockwall Free Methodist Church Life Club, May 11, 2022. So there's that. And then you get a little bag of Smarties, okay? And all of these guys got them too when on, in May. But there you go, Max. All right, I just want y'all to remember. <laughs> yeah, let's, big clap, big clap. <coughs> Just want y'all to remember that not only do we do stuff on Sunday mornings, but we do stuff on Wednesday nights as well. And we need y'all's prayers for the kids on Wednesdays, especially, because it's not just kids from our church that come on Wednesdays. We get other kids on Wednesday nights, too. So, you know, make, make sure you pray for us, and make sure that uh, if you want to help, Miss Marla and I, we would be happy to have people help, wouldn't we, Miss Marla? Yeah, we would love to have help. So if you want to help on Wednesday, and Miss Claudine. Miss Claudine wants to retire one of these days. But, but we just keep pulling her back in and pulling her back in. So, but, but she does an amazing job. That's why we keep pulling her back in. <laughs> so just remember Wednesday nights, all right? Um, Malia, would you like to pray for a Wednesday night? Dear God, thank you for this day. I hope that we all have a wonderful day today and that we all make it home safely from church. And then when CLC starts, we have a lot of kids to learn more and more and more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, good job. Y'all can come down. You can put your sashes right there. Thank you very much. Yay! That's awesome. Thank you very much. Life Club will begin the first Wednesday after Labor Day. I don't have that date, but you know when it, the 7th, okay. September 7th is when Life Club will begin, 6.30 on Wednesday nights.
And if you could tell Malia is eight going on 12. <laughs> At least, yes. <laughs> well, now that the children are back to their seats, let's give them another mission. It's time to take up our Dime a Day missions offering. <laughs> and what happens is that the, the kids in the church bring a container by, and if you have any pocket change or other currency that you would like to give to missions to support our missions partners in Honduras, the Love and Faith Ministries, you can place your money in the buckets that are coming by. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Now, for our regular tithes and offerings, pre-COVID, we would pass an offering plate, which is what we have always done in the United States for as long as I can remember and on back into years way before that. But since COVID, we've been putting an offering plate at the back, and there it's where you would place your tithes and your offerings if you have brought money for the ministry of the church. You can also give on the GiveLify app, GiveLify. Uh, sounds just like it's, it's, it's spelled just like it sounds. Give La Fi app on your phone. And there are posters on the boards and it's on the sign out front and all that kind of thing. So that's another way to give. Or you can just simply mail a check to the church or use your bank's bill pay service. That's what we do and have our bank send a check to the church every week for our tithe. Now, I just got to thinking about that as the kids were taking up their offerings. Other parts of the world do it different ways. If we were in Central America, I would hold a basket or a, some kind of a container right here in front of the church. Uh, the pianist would play the offertory, and all of you that had your offering would bring it up and put it into the container up here at the front. Uh, that's how it's done in Central America. That way, you know, if you don't come forward, then you haven't given any. Is that kind of thing? No, just kidding. Uh, I know in Africa, they put a basket on a pole and they place, and, and instead of you having to handle the plate, the offering plate is on a pole and they just put the pole down the aisles and so you put money into the basket as it passes by on this pole that comes by. So it's always unique and interesting to hear how other cultures uh, take up their tithes and their offerings. Children are dismissed to go to junior church at this time. And we are going to continue in our series in the book of Acts. 
Uh, this morning, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 4. And we're going to move around a little bit because we're going to talk about a specific individual. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. And most of your Bibles are going to have a subheading above verse 4 that says, Philip in Samaria, or something similar to that. It gives you an idea that we're going to be talking about Philip this morning. Philip in Samaria. Chapter 8, Acts, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the message there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. With, for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now from time to time, a man named Simon, who practiced sorcery in the city, uh, and amazed all the people. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, came to him and gave their attention to him and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Peter, uh, excuse me, Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now we're going to stop right there for a moment. The big idea this morning is that God guides and provides for your mission. God has a mission for you. You know that, right? God has a plan for your life. He has a mission for your life. He guides and provides for that mission one step at a time. In other words, don't get overwhelmed by the, the hugeness of this mission and this plan. And you're going, what in the world has God got planned for me? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Take it one step at a time. You ever heard the phrase carpe diem? Carpe diem, a life of adventure, a life of significance, not just success, but one of significance. That's what we all really want in our hearts. Even if our lives up to this point has, has been a drive to succeed or a drive to accumu uh, accumulate stuff, we will soon learn that that stuff and the success, the success that we're after doesn't really satisfy. And that's the lesson that Robin Williams, the actor, was teaching his students in the movie Dead Poets Society. Remember? Those of you that have seen it, um, it playing the character of uh, Professor Keating, Robin Williams, as Professor Keating, leads his students across the campus of their prep school into an ivy-covered building where the memories of past generations line the, the heavy glass trophy cases there. In the scene thick with a, a mustard tradition, he invites his students to gaze at the faces of athletic heroes posing with confidence and smiling back at them within the photos that are now brown with age. He points to the awards and to the trophies that are lined up like, like sentinels that are now just gathering dust. The professor instructs the students uh, uh, to listen to a poem that is going to be read, and one of his students reads, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, O time is still a flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Mm. Professor Keating's teachable moment, carpe diem, seize the day, seize the day, directing the attention of his captivated students to the fading photographs of these campus heroes from days gone by. The professor points out that they weren't that much different than who they, his students, are today. They were youth full of, of vigor and 
feeling invincible. These boys from yesteryear, they were bursting with hope and with life, yet now they're gone. Did they wait until it was too late to make something of their lives? Even a, 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 that, that was something significant? Because then Professor Keating says, because, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing dandelions. But if you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. And Professor Keating placing his ear, his own ear tightly to the, to the glass where the trophies are and the pictures are. He says, listen, go in, lean in and listen. And then he begins to whisper, carpe diem. Do you hear it, guys? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Make your life significant and extraordinary. It's one of those movie scenes that just kind of embeds into your own mind. And, and the light suddenly comes on as you watch it. And, and, and no longer are you left groping in this world of insignificance. You realize that you too can seize the day. You too can begin to make a significance of your life right now where you are. What you want to make different, you can. What you want, what you, the desire for adventure that you have, you can do it. If you hunger for something extraordinary, you can do it. But to seize the day, you have to start right where you are. And it's not just about if I were only, if I only was in another position in life, or if I was in a different place, or if I just, well, I've got to wait until this happens, or I've got to wait. No, you've got to seize the day right now, today, and tomorrow again, and the next day again. Seizing the day means grabbing hold of God's significance for you right where you are. Philip is a great example of that. Philip is a great example. First of all, Philip was faithful right where he was. Right where he was, wherever he was, he was faithful. Obviously, he's a faithful leader in the, in the church in Jerusalem. Now, don't get this Philip mixed up with the Philip of, uh, that was the apostle. They seem to be two different ones. We know that there's another Philip that is named in early on that is one of the deacons, one of the seven deacons that is appointed to the church, right? Uh, Stephen being one of them, Philip being another, and there's and these deacons that are appointed to help out in the distribution of the food in just a few verses earlier in our text. So Philip, this one is called, uh, this gentleman is called Philip the Evangelist as uh, to distinguish him from Philip the Apostle, okay? So he's obviously a faithful leader in the church of Jerusalem. Acts 6, where he was chosen, says that he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That was one part. Why else would he have been chosen to serve and to be one that was administrating and serving tables, giving out the food and the distribution to those that were in need? You see, it's a proven proverb that people will never be faithful in a new role unless they've been faithful in the present role that they're in. Too often we think that if we really can make a difference, in order to really make a difference for Christ, then you have to be in full-time Christian service. I remember hearing that term a lot when I was younger. Full-time full Christian service, which simply meant that God had called an individual to be a pastor or to be a ministry, a, a, a missionary, or to be a teacher in a, a, a Christian university. Full-time Christian service. Yet, God makes it very clear in His Scripture that the primary call on every believer is a call to Himself and a, to a personal relationship with Him. It has nothing to do with one's vocation. It has to do with each of us individually. God's call to you, and you are called. You are called into a relationship with Him, first of all, 
And then you are called to fulfill a plan, a mission that he has for you, no matter what kind of vocation you are involved in. God does call certain men, certain women to full-time Christian service. But if it was up to the growth of the church, it would never happen without everybody else being involved. There is a need for a call to full-time Christian service, but there is also a need for everyone to serve where you are. One gentleman, Ewan um, McManus, has uh, pointed out that to, uh, to leave the impression that you have to be in full-time service to make a difference from Christ, uh, there, there's two things that can be deducted from that. One, if, they, if a person doesn't have a Paul experience, you know, the, the, the road to Damascus experience, doesn't have a Paul experience, and that excuses them from any responsibility to have a conversation with God about their life's work. Well, I haven't been called like Paul was, so I, he doesn't have a job for me, right? No, not at all. It also, second thing it, it does is it demeans any other vocation as a secondary vocation in God's eyes, and we know that's not true. So, all I'm saying is Philip understood that he didn't have to be called into full-time Christian service to make a difference. We don't know what kind of vocation he had, but it wasn't to be, uh, he wasn't one of the apostles. He wasn't one that was called to be the pastor of the church. He was a deacon in the church. But yet, what does he do? He shares the good news wherever he goes. Yes, he definitely realized and appreciated the calling of the 12, the 12 disciples. But he understood that men and women from the workplace were very important for the church to make an impact on the world. Paul, um, Philip, I keep calling him either Paul or Peter. Philip, being a man of the workplace would have access to impact people's lives in, in, in an area where the 12 apostles were not able to. I can't go to all of y'all's jobs. I can't go to all of y'all's workplaces. I can't keep up with, with Kevin and all the play. I mean, he, his office is his truck, right? And he's everywhere. He says, I don't have an office. Yeah, your office is your truck. <laughs> he's, he's everywhere. And look at all the people he meets and impacts every day. Same thing with many of the rest of you. You that, are, you that are teachers, oh my goodness. Not only students, but faculty and parents. Philip understood that everything he did, he did not only for men, but unto the Lord. Oh, that sounds familiar. Do everything as if you're working for the Lord. It's one of the memory verses from last week, from the backpacks, right? Yeah. Philip understood that. The story of creation shows clearly that a man and woman's work was a man and a woman's work is the key arena in which God was expecting them to model their faithfulness in their ministry. Often we mistakenly think that we work. Because of the fall, we have to work hard because of sin in the world, because of the, 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 the original sin. But it's clear even before then that God gave responsibilities to the man and the woman, to the first man and the woman, to take dominion over the creatures, to rule over creation, to name the animals, right? Right? It's also a view of a blessing for another man. God lifts up in Exodus 31 a man named Beziel. He was not a priest. He was not a prophet. But he was a craftsman. He was a craftsman. God describes him in Exodus 31 as one whom I have filled with the Spirit of God with skill, ability, and knowledge of all kinds of crafts. To make artistic designs in gold, silver, bronze, to cut and to set stones, to work with wood and to encourage all kinds of craftsmanship. 
God has called this individual, Beziel, as one who is a craftsman. Don't have to be the pastor to make a difference. Philip understood that, and he was ready to be available right where he was. So the first point is that Philip was faithful right where he was. Second point is Philip was available where God needed him. As the pressure of the persecution began, it says here uh, that they scattered, and as they scattered, they shared the gospel. In fact, it's actually translated and can be translated literally that they gossiped the gospel wherever they went. Isn't that cool? They gossiped the gospel. Oftentimes I've looked at the Great Commission, and instead of saying, go and make disciples of all nations, why not make disciples of all nations while you go? Same kind of thing. As you go through life, share the gospel. So Philip is an example of one who is willing, available to go where God needed him. His life is portrayed by the, by the, the we have several hymns, right, that says, I'll go where you want me to go. There's one that says, wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. I'll go where he leads me to go. God has clearly promised to guide and direct us as we go. Uh, there's... So, Psalms, Proverbs that are filled with these promises. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye upon you. Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are directed and established by the Lord when he delights in his ways and busies himself with his every step. Busies himself with his every step. Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart a man finds the course but the Lord determines his steps. I remember when I was a kid, there was, when I was beginning to read, I mean, later on, up in later elementary and early um, middle school years, we had a biography of David Livingston. And I remember reading that biography of David Livingston. David Livingston was raised on his father's knee being told that he could make a difference in his life through his commitment to Jesus Christ wherever he served. That his father was teaching him that. His father constantly told him stories of great Christian leaders and missionaries. While David Livingston decided he wanted to be a physician, he knew that he had an uphill battle. Having to work in the mills all day. David Livingston lived in the 1800s, right? And go to school at night, followed by getting home at 10 o'clock in the evening, studying till midnight, then turning around and going back to work at 5 in the morning. You getting this? He believed, David Livingston believed that God could use him to change the world. As a teenager, he began to pray a simple prayer and he prayed this, Lord, lead me anywhere, just go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever any tie in my heart except the tie that binds my heart to yours. And we know David Livingston went on to be a great missionary on the continent of Africa, in Central Africa, and was uh, one of the key uh, leaders to bring Christianity to the heart of Africa in the 1800s. Third point is Philip was teachable and willing to reach out beyond the comfort zone. Teachable and willing to reach out beyond his comfort zone. He had been willing to leave the comfort zone of Jerusalem and go into Samaria. Samaria of all places. Jesus' disciples didn't want to go into Samaria. Other Jews didn't venture into Samaria. Samaria was that land mass kind of in between uh, part of uh, Israel in the, in the south and part of Israel in the north. And from go from one to the other, you had to either go through Samaria or you had to go around it. You had to either drive past from north to south. You had to go 
right through it or go around on the east side. You can go around the west side, the Mediterranean's over there. Go around or go through. That's where Philip was led. And not only there, we read a little later, and this is where I wanted to go on down into verse 26. Verse 26 of chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the, to the road, the desert road, and go that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip to go to that, said, go to that chariot and stay near it. As Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. The passage of scripture the eunuch was reading, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth." What in the world is he talking about? Philip begins with that very passage and begins to explain to him how Jesus Christ came, suffered, and died, and was buried, and was raised to life again, and now lives forever as our Lord and our Savior. And the long and the short of it, as you continue reading the passage, this eunuch is, is uh, saved. He gives his life to Jesus, and he even says, well, here's some water here as they're passing in the water in the desert. There was some there. And he said, can I even be baptized? And Philip said, well, of course you can. And so he's baptized right then, right there. Philip was teachable and willing to go anywhere, everywhere for his Lord. What are we saying this morning? Philip was an amazing man who did his job day in and day out every day of his life. He sees the day. Whatever God had planned for him that day, he sees the day. He was not one of those that had pulled out his, his iPhone and checked his agenda and says, okay, I'm going to do this today, I'm going to do this today, I'm going to do this today. We're all guilty of having those to-do lists, right? Those punch lists. And that's not all bad. We've got to keep our life organized. But instead of having a list of things to do and saying, God, I got, God, I've got all this to do today. Won't you bless it for me? Why not go to God with an open to-do list and say, God, what do you have planned for me this day? God, can I go through this list? Will you guide me? Will you direct my steps? And who are you going to bring into my life that I can just be a light of Jesus to? That I can be the salt to this day. Be the light. Be the salt. Encourage one another about Jesus. That's what Philip did. That's what we can do if we would just seize the day. But we've got to be like Philip now, if it, it makes an acronym, faithful, available, teachable. Did you get that? F-A-T. Let's be fat for Jesus. Let's be fat for Jesus. Let's be faithful. Let's be available. And let's be teachable. Got it? Are we willing to follow? Let's follow Jesus. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, as we just think of Philip and the example that he's given us and how we can seize the day, carpe diem, every day, for you, God. Not for ourselves, but for you, God. 
What do you have planned for us? What are you going to have us to do today? Who are you going to give us to talk to, to encourage, to share the good news with? Just to simply say, well, this is what God has done for me, and he can do this for you. Are we ready to follow? Are we ready to be Phillips in the kingdom of God? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, that your blessing would be upon us and that we would be found faithful, that we would be found available, that we would be found teachable. Father, impress your will upon us, for we know, Lord, that you have a blessing waiting for us 
when we follow you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you.